This is Pastor Jacob, New Crossroads Community Church at 110 Washington Street, Williamston, North Carolina. We have services every Sunday morning at 1130. So that means you can sleep in. If you feel a little hungover, get you a little more rest and you can come on in. And then we have Bible study, discipleship class, we call it, on Thursday nights at 6.30. So just come join us. We have treats for the children and the adults after every service. So come join us. Get the word and get a treat. God bless you. Let us turn in our Bibles to James chapter 2. We're back in the book of James. And it, it worked out perfectly that everything that we were doing in between James all of the, the, the scriptures that we came up, we, we were uh, discussing in between getting back to James was um, still leaning into this same message. So it, it worked out perfectly. The Holy Spirit knows exactly what he's doing, even if I do not. So um, there, James chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. They got Bibles back there, big print Bibles back there. James chapter 2, verse 8 through 13. And the topic of our message this morning is mercy over judgment. Mercy over judgment. <clears throat> Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to worship you on your day, the Lord's day. Lord, we, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you through the study of your word, Lord. We thank you for all of your blessings, all of your kind and tender mercy, oh God. We ask you to open our hearts that we will receive your truth. Open our ears that we will hear your voice loud and clear in the scriptures. Open our minds that our understanding will be fruitful. And Lord, please open our eyes that we will behold wondrous things in your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Mercy over judgment. James chapter two, verses eight through 13. And really quick, before I get started with this, really quick, I just wanted to say the, 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 the message keeps coming to, to the young ladies. I want y'all to hear this, uh, especially the message keeps coming, the, the, the warning keeps coming that y'all have to be careful where you are in the darker hours, that you have to be careful at the gas pumps, that you have to be careful at the grocery stores, that you have to be careful when you're out with your children or when you are out alone. No, that's right. You have to be very careful. And so this, this, this keeps coming over and over again. I'm going to say it again, so can't nobody say that Pastor Jacob didn't tell you. Ladies, old and young, Children, stay with your parents. Yes. If you got little, 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 little youngins like um, little Michael, or like you know Jay Size, that, if they, if you can put them in the basket, that's what I do. Because Jason and Bella, they love to to run and get away. Okay, no, put them in the basket, and then you can push them wherever you have to go. That way, you don't have to try as hard to keep your eye on them. But um. He posted something last night that, that we were talking about this morning about uh, somebody who was right here at Williamston Walmart. So it wasn't far away. It's right here in the same town where a, a woman said that she was in the store with her husband and her child. Her husband went on his way. She was with the child and she kind of stepped away from the child just a little. And she said it was a guy that was following them, that was lurking behind him. And then when he seen her husband, he kind of backed off. But he was looking, at least from what the post said, it looked like he was coming after that baby. Y'all have to be very careful. Do not take this in one ear and not the other. Amen. Don't think this is just something funny. You go to the gas station. Y'all got all day to get gas. Get oh. gas while the sun is out, while people can see you. Don't go get your gas at night. And then somebody snatch your little hind parts up. And then everybody around here looking for you and crying. Because you won't listen to me. Lana. Lana. But I ain't gonna call a lot of names no more. But that's it. All right. Mercy over judgment, James chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That is the word of God. You may be seated. <clears throat> there was a young soldier in Napoleon's army who committed an offense that was worthy of death. The day before he was scheduled to be set in front of the firing squad, that young man's mother went to Napoleon and begged for mercy. She said to him, please don't, 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 don't kill my son. And Napoleon responded to her. He said, woman, your son does not deserve any mercy. And she said this. She said, I know. If he did, then it wouldn't be mercy. Spiritually, we are much like this young man. We are all uh, worthy of the wrath of God. We are all no, no, undeserving right. of that's his mercy. Come on. So the lesson for us today is to give the same grace to others that we ourselves need. To offer the same mercy to others that we have received generously from God. So I want to kind of show from this text that we are most like Christ when we love others, when we recognize our own unrighteousness, and when we acknowledge our own need for mercy. In verse 8, James explains that we are most like Christ when we fulfill the royal law. Okay, so according to this verse, this is the law of love, loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. So it says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well if you really fulfill that royal law. So then one reason that we call it the royal law or the excellent command is because it's emphasized, it emphasizes the fair and just treatment of others. Um, one of the, the main reasons that we call it the royal law, that it's called the royal law, is because it comes from the mouth of our king, Jesus Amen. Christ. Come on. Amen. John 13, 34 says it like this. A new commandment I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Christ intends for us to reflect his loving nature to those around us as we follow this command. Another reason that it's called the royal law is this command is a law that every human being, every reasonable person lives by. Every reasonable person, whether they are considered believers or unbelievers, whether they are considered holy or secular, every one of these people, every, every, every human being, a reasonable person, lives by this law that we want to treat others right, that we should be treated right, that each human being is deserving of dignity. These are things that we find to be true worldwide. General law. So that's another reason why we call it the 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 royal law, because as we are all subjects of the kingdom of God, whether now by choice or in the end by force, we all are subject to that same rule to love others as we love ourselves. 
However, James says, if, look at verse 8, James says, if you really fulfill this law, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. So what James is saying when he says, if, if is a big word. Right. He's saying that if you do this, you do well. So that's a, a, a veiled way of James basically saying that most often, more often than not, we don't love others like we should. More often than not, we do not reflect Jesus Christ like we should. More often than not, we are not as kind, as loving, as fair, as impartial as we think we are. He said, if you really fulfill this law, you do well. If you really fulfill it. But that means that he's saying, you're not really fulfilling it. You're not really doing it. Why? Why? Because the only person, as we read in, uh, we, we read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that whole love chapter, and love is kind, and love is this, and love is that, and we find ourselves lost in many of those things. What does that mean then? That means that when we look at love in all of its perfections, what the Bible says love should be, love is kind, love is patient. Love doesn't boast. Love doesn't puff itself up. Love isn't prideful. And all of these things we can say at some time or other, we are. Then we can admit that we do not love like we should. We can admit what James is telling us in a veiled way that we do not really fulfill the royal law. Y'all understand that? And so when we, when we look at it that way, and we understand that we're not necessarily doing what we should be doing, that we're not reaching the standard that Jesus Christ set. When we're not fulfilling that standard, when, when we're not reaching that standard, then that makes us sit back and think, how are we supposed to love others? If Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself, none of us can really say we love somebody else the way we love our own selves. Do we do as much for others as we do for ourselves? No. And so then what, what, what do we think about? We have to, when we look at the scripture, we have to reflect, we have to introspect and say, something's wrong with my heart. I don't love like I should. I don't talk like I should. I don't walk like I should. I don't do the things I should do. So then that leads us to this fact that when we display prejudice, racism, any unfairness or unjust weights, we are not loving our neighbors. We are not reflecting the light of Christ. And so with that being the case, that leads us to this next this next fact, when we recognize that we cannot possibly uphold the standard in verses 9 through 11, we are better able to appreciate the work of Christ at the cross. Now, look at verses 9 through 11. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are what? Convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in what? One point. He is guilty of all, the whole thing. For he who said, and that's God, do not commit adultery, he also said what? Do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So what do we do? James makes a glaring statement. What do we do with this? He says, if you fail one law, you fail them all. All you got to get is one thing. And God does not accept it because God says he's coming back for a what? A church without what? Spot or wrinkle. Nothing can be on this. It must be perfect. It must be spotless. When you read the Old Testament, 
every sacrifice. He said, if it got a blemish on it, I don't want it. He said, if it's got anything wrong with it, any kind of markings, any kind of different color, I don't want it. Don't give it to me. Right? You go back and read uh, uh, Leviticus. I just finished reading through Leviticus uh, this past week. And there it said that even the priests, now mind you, I wouldn't be able to offer a sacrifice there. There, it, it, there was a priest who had eczema. Eczema. Something that you can't, you can't control, eczema. Because not only did the sacrifice have to be pure and perfect, the priest had to be Amen. perfect with no defects. So even if a person had, if a person had any kind of bodily defect, or if they even had eczema, you could not even be the priest to offer the sacrifice to God. Because so, so think about. What this says about who Jesus is, if the sacrifice, and Jesus was the sacrifice, had to be perfect without spot or blemish or imperfection, that was Jesus. And then he's also our high priest, meaning that he could not have any spot, blemish, or imperfection. He was the perfect one. He was able to offer the sacrifice of himself to God on our behalf. So then, no, none of us are able to rise up to that standard of verses 9 through 11. That if we fail one law, we're guilty of them all. You can say, well, I didn't lie. I didn't lie. Okay, well, you don't lie. What else do you do? You're going to find yourself failing in some area. And if you fail in that area, you fail the entire thing. Y'all understand it? Yeah. So then there is no, again, when we're, when we're reading this verse in context, we understand he's talking about being partial, being partial or impartial, that we can't have big eyes and little U's. We can't uh, uh, put the rich folk in the nice places and tell the, 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 the poor folk, you go sit in the back, we can't nobody see you. We're supposed to treat everybody the same. And so then what he's saying is when you are impartial, when you are being partial, when you are being prejudice for whatever reason because there's many reasons you could be prejudiced you could be prejudiced over the color of someone's skin you could be prejudiced over the gender you could be prejudiced over uh, 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 their uh, status the financial statuses whatever there's so many things we could be prejudiced of and God says he does not like it if you treat a black person better than you treat a white person, God says, that's unjust. That's right. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Hey, come on now. If you tr treat a Democrat better than you treat a Republican, God says, that's unjust. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do that if I were you. If you're going to be like me, if you're going to be like me, if you're going to be like me, you have to love those who hate you and bless those who yes. curse you. So even if you're not looking out for my best interest, God gave me a law that says I'm supposed to love you like I love myself. He didn't say you had to do it back. Now you will be held against that law. He will judge you according to that law. Did you love Jacob the way he loved you? And the answer would be no. But then I'm also responsible for loving you, no matter if you reciprocated that thing or not. If you didn't show me the love I feel like I deserve, that still doesn't give me the right to render evil for evil because the Bible tells us, do not render evil for evil. Come on. Come on. That's the word. So again, when we, when we talk about love, and mind you, especially in the home, if I'm supposed to love someone outside of my home, outside of myself. How much more the person in my home? How much more the person that I'm married to? So, so again, we can't render evil for evil. Oh, well, my, 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 my husband didn't treat me right today. My husband didn't do right today. God said, love him. My wife didn't do right today. My wife 
she she just God said love her. Period. We do not, as we say, we don't match energy. That is not a Christian thing. We do not match energy. Match energy gets you out of a husband or a wife. You did it, so I'm gonna do it. Then you won't be married. Now. Yeah. Yeah. When we when we look at the standard that Jesus set, we understand that the most important rules pertain to loving and honoring God first and foremost, followed by the secondary law, which is aimed at our treatment of one another. Matthew 22 verses 36 through 40 says this. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your what? Mind. Now, let me stop right there. A lot of people tell you, turn your mind off. That ain't what this verse said. If you are going to worship God in spirit and in truth, that also involves your mind. I've heard too many times people say, you got you to gotta turn your mind off. No, 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 no. Do not turn your mind off. Or basically what they're saying is get your thoughts out of your worship. Like, like, like you're thinking too much. No, 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 no. The Bible says my thoughts need to be turned heavenly. My thoughts need to be here. Come on. Now, again, my thoughts don't need to be all over the place. My mind needs to be focused on them. But that doesn't mean that my mind needs to be, I need to block my mind out and just do whatever because that shows a lack of self-control and the Holy Spirit gives us, he produces the fruit of what? Self-control. So Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and what? Great commandment. And the second is like it, not greater, but the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands, hang all the law and the prophets. So unless you know something humanity has not figured out since the beginning of time, this level of love takes a righteousness and a perfection that we cannot obtain. Amen. We do not have those attributes. Only one person has the attributes to love and to love perfectly and has the attributes of unmatched, unrivaled righteousness. Come on. Jesus. Jesus. So we must think soberly about trying to keep laws or do good deeds as a means of working for our salvation. We were talking about this in um, Bible study the other week. We don't work for our salvation because God said, I don't care what you do, you can't afford this. No. Come on, but he says, what we went over last week is he says, it's a what? A gift. And a gift is what? Free. A gift is given freely without cost. So then if a gift is given, then do I owe you for this gift? No. But why would we work? Why we do the things we do is because we show our gratitude and our appreciation for this immensely valuable gift this salvation that I could never afford, you came and died for me. I couldn't give you anything. None of my good works could be worth your life. But you did that for me. Now I'm willing to give my life for you out of appreciation. Not because I'm working for this, but because I appreciate what you did for me. And so we will fail completely and fall repeatedly until we recognize our own unrighteousness and our utter weakness. We should instead seek to elevate and to appreciate the righteousness of Jesus Christ and him alone. Yeah. Now, finally, Jesus. we must acknowledge that we need mercy too. Yeah, man. So just as others are unrighteous, we recognize our own unrighteousness and just as others need mercy, 
and we 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 kind of and this is what James talking about. We 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 don't want to show mercy to others, but he said you better show mercy because the mercy that you give is going to be the mercy that you need. If you give no mercy, you will receive no mercy. If you give little mercy, you will receive little mercy. But if you are very merciful, then God will be very merciful with us. So according to verses 12 to 13, our aim is to operate in the law of liberty and not in the restrictions of do's and don'ts. So let's read uh, 12 to 13 really quickly. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty or the law that sets free. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. And mercy triumphs over judgment. So we understand that when we look at the fact that mercy triumphs over judgment, that is most like God's character. We are most like God. We are most like Christ when we recognize our unrighteousness and when we recognize and acknowledge our need for mercy. We, we acknowledge this need for mercy. We are clear that the standard is an impossible one, right? Yet, we should aim as high as we can, not seeking to just get by. So when we talk about, when we talk about this law of liberty versus the, the restrictions of do's and don'ts, when we look at the law, it is how you look at it. It is your perception of it. Our perception of the law should change. Loving your neighbor as you love yourself should be something that inspires you, not something that restricts you. Come on. Amen. Something that empowers you, not something that binds you. All right. So, so think about it like this. When somebody does something hurtful to you, when somebody does something wrong to you, and you resist the urge to fight back. You resist the urge to get them back. You resist the urge. When you resist that urge, what is your perception? How is your, what is your mindset? Y'all y'all following me? If your mindset is, I, you know, I can do you, I, I can do you dirty. I can really get you. But I ain't gonna do it. I ain't gonna do it. That's the wrong mindset. Why? Because what did Jesus say when he was on that cross? When he was being beaten, when he was being stabbed, when he's been spit upon, when the beard was being plucked out of his face, when they put the crown of thorns on him, when he asked for something to drink and they gave him vinegar and, and, and gall to drink. And what did he say? He didn't say, you know what? When I get up from here, I'm going to fix all y'all jokes. That's what he would have said. But what did he say? What did he say? Father, forgive them. Why? Because they do not know what they're doing. His mindset was on forgiving them. His mindset was on not, he, he wasn't restricted. He was empowered with love. He was engulfed with love, even on the cross, by the people who were torturing him. How many of us can say that as soon as somebody says something bad about me, I'm through with you. I'm done with you. I don't want to hear nothing from you. Leave me alone. Don't talk to me. I don't want to talk to you. Don't call me. I won't call you. Just leave me alone. That's how that works. But Jesus said, deny yourself. Stop doing what you want to do. Don't live the way you want to live. Don't continue walking the way you want to walk. Take up your cross. It's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. It's going to take a lot of work. And follow me. Count the cost. No, it's going to cost you something. It may cost you friends. It may cost you family. It may cost you those who you thought was on your side. But God says, if I be for you, who can be against you? Just getting by is not rooted in love and appreciation for God or our fellow man. The highest form of love God showed us was his great mercy 
when he sent his son to die in our places. He showed us a mercy so great that we could never repay him. Still, still, God wants his children to show a measure. But we can't show the mercy he showed us by no means. Amen. But he wants us to show a measure, a measure of that great mercy to others, reflecting his goodness towards us. So our lives should be marked as followers of Jesus Christ. Our lives should be marked, should be evidenced by our reflection of Jesus Christ. Amen. How much are we like Christ? Do people see Jesus in us? Are we reflecting Jesus in us, in our church, in our love towards one another, in the way we treat people, in the way we treat our spouses, in the way we, we deal with our family and how we love others? Are we showing the light of Jesus Christ? Or are we putting out a, a bad reflection? You ever see uh, uh, people take pictures on uh, Facebook? And this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. Pictures anywhere. On social media, they take pictures and the glass is dirty. Listen, here's the thing. How about you use some Windex and clean the glass and then take the picture? I don't know why that's so hard. But the glass be just nasty and they take the picture and they say, excuse the glass. Excuse, excuse the mirror. It's cleaning. <laughs> and then take the picture like, you got it. So you got to have this picture out. You looking so good that you didn't have no time to clean this mirror. Before you took it, mirror looking filthy. But that is the kind of reflection we give off of Christ when we do not show the love He showed, when we do not show mercy, when we are a, 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 a prejudice or partial, when we show partiality toward rich people and, and disregard the poor, when we show partiality towards black people and disregard the white, or show partiality toward the white and disregard the black. Or, or whatever the case. When we show partiality, God said, I'm not in it. Right. That is not my spirit. I'm not, I'm not nowhere near that. We must remember that we are undeserving of God's love. Amen. We do not deserve his grace. We deserve his wrath. Jesus. But his mercy towards us triumphed over his judgment. God could look on us poor, pitiful, blind, and naked, worthless, and love us, and raise us up, bring us back to life, restore us to a right relationship with him. How much more grace, how much more mercy, how much more love can we show to others? When we think about it, when we think about how other people treat us, all we got to do is think about what Jesus took for us. Come on. And if Jesus took it for us, then we could take this for him. Nothing we take now from nobody. Nothing we take off of nobody. Some people don't take nothing off of nobody. That's that what they say. They say this about Chuck Norris. They say Chuck Norris is like a uh, cheap toilet paper. They say he don't take nothing off of nobody. <laughs> That's what they say. Don't be saying now. But, but, but Jesus, Jesus dealt with everything. And he took it all for us. So then in that same vein, when we're dealing with our spouse, hard-headed husbands, hard-headed wives, uh, uh, hard-headed children, Hard-headed family members, hard-headed friends, co-workers, bosses, you name it. When we're dealing with these people who are hard to love, remember that yes, remember that we were hard for God to love, and God still said, Jesus still called us friends. We were not his friends. The Bible says we were still enemies of his when he saved us. Yes. But Jesus called us friends. Yeah, so Let us stand. We 
we don't want to we don't want to ever take for granted the work that Jesus Christ put in on that cross. I might not be guilty of the sins that you're guilty of. I might not have done the things you've done. And you might not have done the stuff I did. And I did a bunch of things that I look back now and I say, that was that was wrong. I was horrible. I was a horrible person. I can look back now and honestly say, Lord, thank you for saving me because I was, that was horrible. I was horrible, horrible, horrible. And I'm still not perfect, but I'm a long way from where I was. Thank God I'm not who I used to be. But God is in the saving business. And Jesus, his sacrifice all them years ago is still, still the most valuable asset that anyone could ever have in their lives, even to this day, and will be forevermore. When we when we spend eternity in heaven, if you come on this side, when we spend eternity in heaven, we'll still be talking about how he saved. Oh, how he loved us. Yeah. How, how that song go? Oh, how he loved us. Oh, how he loved us. We got a song that even the angels can't sing. I have been redeemed. Bought with the price. Hey, come on, man. Jesus has changed my whole life. Amen. If you do not know Jesus for the pardon of your sin, now is the time. I uh, make it clear every single time you coming up here repeating after me. Don't mean you no different if you do not believe every word that comes out of your mouth. Yeah. But you ain't got to come up here and repeat nothing after me. If you believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he is God in the flesh, yes. that he died on that cross, that he lived a perfect life. He died on that cross. He rose again the third day and that he ascended to the right hand of the father. That is the gospel that saves. That is the power of God. For all who do what? Believe. You must believe. You can repeat after me all day. You can repeat till you turn blue in the face. You can talk to talk. But if it's not in your heart and God knows what's in your heart and what ain't. Your failure, as we read, your failure to, to, to hit that standard does not mean that you're not saved. Your failure to meet God's standard does not mean you're not saved. All it means is that you need a savior. And Jesus Christ, well, what did Jesus say? Unless you exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes, Jesus is the only one who exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes because they were the most righteous in their time. But Jesus said, the best of us our righteousness is as filthy rags. Believe on Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for taking your time out to talk to us, to teach us, to help us to appreciate your work, O oh God. Lord, we know without you, we are nothing. Without you, we are lost, O oh God. But thank you. In due time, you died for us while we were yet sinners. And that if we believe on you today, you receive us and you seal us with your Holy Spirit, oh God. So, Lord, we ask you to watch over us, to keep us, protect us, and provide for us every single thing that we have a need of according to your riches and glory, oh God. We bless your name. We worship you because of who you are. You are holy, holy, holy. And all of your judgments are righteous, true, and perfect. And we bless your name, O oh God. Amen. Lord, at this moment, we ask you to pierce the heart of any young man or young woman who needs to know you for the pardoning of their sin. Lord, express to them that they're not too old or too young, that you came to save all, all who will believe. And so we bless your name, O oh God. Lord, we ask you to look upon those Mother Jackson, Sister Wanda, Amen. 
remember uh, Charlene and Jason and Isabella and the James family, Lord, remember them. Lord, all those who are dealing with any kind of sickness, Lord, we ask you to heal their bodies, to take care of them, to keep them, to watch over them, to protect them, to provide for them. Lord, cover them, keep them under your precious blood, oh God. Lord, remember anybody in this building who is feeling bad, who's not feeling good, who's having any hurt and any pain going on. Lord, we ask you to heal their bodies, to touch their bodies, even right now as we speak, oh God. Lord, let nobody in this building leave out the same way they came in, physically, spiritually, mentally, or emotionally, oh God. Heal the hurts from the past. Heal the hurts from the pain that others have caused and that we have caused ourselves. Heal us, oh God. Heal us, oh God. Save us, oh God. Help us, Lord, to fulfill that royal law, oh God. Lord, we love you. Yes, Lord. But we only love you because you first loved us. Lord, we ask you to be with us. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.